My name is Will Wirtz with the LaRouche Political Action Committee, and we're here today interviewing State Senator from Virginia, Richard Black, uh, who is a retired colonel uh, in, from the U.S. military. He was also uh, the chief uh, uh, JAG uh, uh, officer in the criminal Div division at the Pentagon. Uh, and he has extraordinary uh, experience in terms of uh, particularly Syria, where he's visited a number of times. Uh, the purpose of this interview is to get uh, Senator Black's views uh, of the current crisis uh, surrounding the allegation uh, of a chemical weapons uh, attack uh, in East uh, Ghouta, in the city of Douma, uh, Syria. Yes. Um you know, I've been watching this very closely. I think all of us have because um, President Trump has surrounded himself by a war cabinet. Uh, when he chose John Bolton, uh, John Bolton is as extreme as anybody that you can find in the foreign policy arena. Uh, very much an extremist on, on war. Uh, he was one of the uh, individuals who uh, promoted uh, the invasion of Iraq, uh, which turned out to be based on false uh, premises. And uh, yet here he is again. And he is uh, an individual who is likely to call for war in, in many circumstances. So anyway, so, so we... We had this situation boiling up. It started several weeks ago where the British began this hysterical media campaign saying that the Syrian army was going to use poison gas against the terrorists in, in the East Ghouta suburbs. This is a very large area uh, deep in the suburbs of, uh, of Damascus, which is a sprawling city. They've held it since about 2012 and uh, uh, built a system of underground tunnels that they've used to, you know, when the Syrians would try to restore order, they would emerge from somewhere and ambush them and slaughter a bunch of them. So they had held it for all this time. And the British, anyway, the British uh, claimed that the, the Syrian army, which had massed to finally uh, eliminate the, the Gouda pocket, that they were going to use poisonous gas. And uh, it sounded like it was going to happen imminently. Well, as it turned out, the, the Syrian army, led by the, the Tiger forces, by the Republican Guard, by some very elite groups, um, they, they managed to burst through the enemy ranks uh, by attacking from unexpected quarters. And they rolled over the terrorist with such uh, such uh, uh, rapidity that they actually captured the major um, chemical weapons facility that was possessed by the terrorist. This apparently was the facility that was to be used to create a, a hoax, to create a, uh, an incident where the terrorists would fire on civilians, claiming it, that it was the Syrians. And once they, they had lost this, uh, this uh, laboratory, then, then they didn't have anything else to fight with. And before long, a major part of the entire Gouda uh, uh, pocket had simply evaporated. And so Finally, you had one group, which was Jaish al-Islam, and it holds the, the city of Douma. Now, a little bit further away, you have another pocket, which is totally held by ISIS. Um, but all of the action right now is at Douma. Well, the Syrian army attacked Douma, and they had similar success. They were... They were uh, breaking through all of the barriers that were there. And uh, uh, so finally, Jaish al-Islam uh, agreed that uh, they would 
conduct peace talks and they arrived at an agreement that they would move some of their people uh, out into other rebel held areas. Um, they asked that their severely wounded be evacuated by bus uh, and the, the Syrian government sent in air conditioned buses and evacuated the, uh, the casualties that they had and then began to evacuate the soldiers themselves. They wouldn't let them carry their heavy weapons, but they let them carry their sidearms, uh, their, you know, their automatic rifles and so forth. And uh, so the evacuation was taking place. The battle for Gouda was won. It was essentially over. Uh, and it was just sort of a matter of arranging to evacuate the terrorists because it's been the policy of Syria to cause as little damage to property and as few as little damage to human life as possible and uh, consequently rather than duke it out to the bitter end they simply allow the terrorists to evacuate and they've done this throughout the war. Um, very small number of casualties in this in this uh, I think the United Nations is estimating about 1600 civilians have been killed which considering the magnitude of this battle is very small um, and so so we have this situation where the war was won the terrorists were being evacuated and then the terrorists said well give us give us uh, a truce so that we can kind of get some things arranged and under the cover of the truce the white helmets who are uh, an arm of al-qaeda and al-qaeda to remind our viewers is the group that flew four aircraft into the twin towers in the pentagon and slaughtered 3,000 americans on 9-11 that's what white helmet is and so white helmet has staged a provocative incident and they portrayed it as uh, as a poison gas attack they claimed it was a sarin gas attack um, sarin gas is a colorless odorless gas um, if sarin gas were here in this room today we wouldn't know it until we fell over right. uh, and yet uh, the claims are that uh, uh, people smelled chlorine and so the, the, the terrorists don't entirely understand the chemistry of what they're working with so they, they mix up what chlorine gas is which has a very strong characteristic aroma and sarin gas um, <coughs> But anyway, they made this claim and immediately, just on cue, all of the, the major NATO powers said, we've got to, we've got to attack Syria. Um, they never said, well, may, we, we need to find out whether an attack occurred and we've got to find out if it did, who caused it. Uh, it was just automatic, okay, we've got to attack Syria. So it's clearly a pretext and, and I suspect that it was a pretext that the British were involved in mm -hmm. because of their hysterics several weeks before uh, the chemical laboratory was, it was captured by the Syrian army. Um, so now here we are uh, on the verge of attacking Syria and it is not even clear that there was an attack. Uh, there was a very credible, now, and, and this could, you know, we, we don't know for sure, but very credible fellow, he, he was a, an English speaking uh, physician uh, from the major hospital in Duma and he said, we've never had any casualties brought in we've never had any reports of of uh, poison gas or anything of that sort 
Now, if, uh, if this had occurred, it certainly you would have had a flood of, of uh, you know, casualty. Even if, let's yeah. say, their, their initial report was, I think, 40 people had been killed. <clears throat> Even with that, you'd have had a flood of people being brought into the hospital and, uh, and everybody would have known about it. Well, here's the, yeah. uh, you know, he's reporting, but we haven't heard about anything. So we don't even know that this happened. This may just simply be much like Khan Shikun, which was a, uh, it was a uh, uh, propaganda ploy to get us to fire missiles, which we did, uh, uh, President Trump fired missiles. And now we, it's not clear, but we could be on the verge of attacking the good guys to help the bad guys. Because yeah. once, once this final pocket is cleared out, and it's not having to be cleared out by combat, it's being cleared out by emptying it out right. with buses right. uh, and evacuating these people. And, uh, and the people, by the way, are, are ecstatic that they're finally released because they've been held hostage for since 2012. And, uh, uh, and they're, they're all reporting about how they were enslaved, how, the, you know, Jaysh al-Islam was famous for, uh, they, they build these steel cages and they would put women in them. And then wherever they were staging an attack on Damascus by firing mortars or artillery, they would put a cage filled with, with these women hostages yep. so that the uh, Syrian army couldn't, uh, couldn't respond in kind. So now they're, they're gone. I mean, the, 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 the war for East Gouda is over and there remains only one small pocket totally controlled by ISIS. And the United States is considering going in and attacking the legitimate, duly elected Syrian government in order to prevent them from attacking this last pocket of ISIS in, uh, in uh, Damascus. And the idea that we would align ourselves with ISIS against the elected government that uh, clearly represents the people is just, it is astounding. The United States has been at war in the Mideast for 17 years. That is longer than the First World War, the Second World War, and the Vietnam War combined. The grand total we have been in longer and the First World War, the Second World War, and the Vietnam War. <clears throat> how long are we going to fight over there? <clears throat> and how can somebody demonstrate for you and for me one single thing that the United States people have ever gained from this? We've, we've added $7 trillion to the national debt. Now, we made a big thing about how much... Uh, President Obama had added to the national debt, and fair enough, but nobody bothered to say, well, wait a minute, this wasn't all just his uh, personal inclinations. Seven trillion dollars out of a 20, 21 million dollar debt is from these useless, stupid wars that we fought. And anybody who says, well, we had to do it because we had to uh, we had to suppress terrorism. Mm. When we started off, the terrorists mm. amounted to hundreds of people. Before we were finished, they were launching 20, 30, 40 mechanized armored divisions. They were taking mm. over capitals of countries. They were, you know, they had expanded. They controlled an area. Uh, that was larger than many countries and slaughtering hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. Um, where is the benefit? What have we achieved? And, and believe me, 
Nobody loves our troops more than I do. I've been wounded in action. I volunteered over and over again for frontline combat. And I have tremendous respect for the guys who go over and they believe in their country. They believe in what we're doing. God bless them. Uh, and my heart breaks for the ones who, who suffer. Uh, but but we, we get the prosthetic devices, we get the caskets, and Saudi Arabia gets the oil money, and Great Britain gets the empire. What does the American people get? What, what do we get out of all of this stuff? Nothing. Just a, a final question, which is, is not even, it's not so much a question. Uh, I just wanted to give you an opportunity uh, perhaps to uh, address President Trump. What would you say to him now in terms of the serious situation uh, in particular, uh, but, but more generally as well? I think I would tell him, look, <clears throat> there are certain areas where I can give you tremendous credit. You know, uh, some of the economic things he's done, I think, have been very shrewd. Um, very wise. The worst thing of all, though, is foreign policy. He has, he has let foreign policy lead us to the brink of the Third World War. And, uh, and his, his campaign promises were exactly on point. We don't really have any significant uh, differences with Russia. I mean, not ones that are fundamental to the American national interest, um, except for stopping nuclear war. That's the, yep. That is the one national interest. If we got away from that, then all of a sudden NATO, NATO already spends four times as much as Russia does on their defense budget, mm. and he's complaining they're not spending enough. Well, if four times isn't enough, how many times is? So we need to, we need to diminish the role of, of, uh, of, the, of uh, NATO. Um, regime change needs to be absolutely out. And right now the United States has occupied with our forces a third of Syria and we've done it secretly. We've got about 6,000 troops on the ground. Remember, no boots on the ground, about 6,000 of them, a couple of them were killed just, just yesterday or day before. And uh, we have a minimum of 12 American bases on sovereign Syrian territory. And uh, we're trying to redraw the map of, of, uh, of Syria in a way that will absolutely guarantee the next war. And so uh, he should go back to what he did is uh, we, we will work with Syria, we will end the war and uh, do away with regime change. All of the things he campaigned on were great ideas. And he has, uh, I, I would give him a zero on foreign policy right now. I think, uh, I think it's very poor and he has surrounded himself. He always said, I know how to pick the very best people. He has the worst war cabinet. I mean, at this point, we look at General Mattis as being the dove of the bunch. Mm. We got Nikki Haley. She's supposed to be our top diplomat. You never hear her when she's not screaming hysterically for war. What kind of a diplomat Mm. Is, is doing that. A diplomat is supposed to be trying to find common ground, trying to move away from, from war. Nikki Haley, she, she's similar to John Bolton that way. If somebody says, well, let's attack Ireland. Yeah, let's attack Ireland. Let's go after them, kill them. Um, I, we got to get away from this. I mean, we've got people who are just really irrational mm. 